Hello, my friends. Welcome to On Point with Rachel Turgerman. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Tonight, topic of conversation is getting to know attorney Joe Perkins, who's running for candidate of Miami-Dade Circuit Court Judge. Joe Perkins, many times you have heard me say, my friends, that you need to be informed in order to vote. And that's why we have taken the liberty of inviting him today so that you can see his platform, so you can learn his story and realize why he's the best candidate for a circuit court judge. Joe, how are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm very excited. Oh, we're so excited too. Wow, we want to hear your story. We want to hear about your upbringing, what you've done in law. There's so many things you got to tell our viewers tonight. So let's get started. Let's begin with your upbringing, Joe. Tell us, where were you born? Talk to us. So I grew up in the Philadelphia area of Pennsylvania, and uh, my family was dispersed across Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Cool. Um, lived a normal uh, American life, uh, washed dishes when I was 14 years old after school. Thank uh, you to character, my I like it. Yes, and uh, I, I met my wife uh, when I was 18 in college, and uh, we, we fell in love. I, um, I knew from the moment I laid, his on, laid eyes on her that uh, yeah, she was the one, and we eloped as teenagers and ran away and got married in secret. You and, eloped? Uh, yes, and uh, we just celebrated 17 years of marriage. God bless you. That's beautiful. And since we're in the subject of marriage, since you brought it up, what would you like to give as far as advice to all our viewers? I know there's thousands of people that are going to be watching you and that are watching mm -hmm. you. What makes a good marriage? Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer. I can tell you that I, my wife and I are partners. And I think being a partner first and just being honest and sincere and uh, thankful to each other, and that's worked for us, so. That is so I wish, I wish I knew the secret answer, though. Well, 17 years, you know, a lot of people mm -hmm. don't make it that long. So I wanna wish you 120 more years of happiness and of health, so on and so forth. Okay, so once you, you grew up and everything, and, and uh, obviously your parents, you know, everybody's parents have some kind of uh, value in our lives. So what would you say, if you would have to single out some of the values that your parents instilled upon you as you were growing up that left you like an indelible type of feeling in your heart that this is what I wanted to learn, this is what I wanted to be. Tell us, share that with us. Yeah, uh, that, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I would say kindness is the first word that comes to mind. Uh, sincerity, um, humility. Uh, I, I grew up uh, with in a humble environment, but I re always remember my parents giving, giving to the community, serving the community, uh, even when we didn't have. So uh, I think that's the big one. That is beautiful. And so are your parents still alive? Or? Uh, my mother passed away this year uh, and my father is still alive. I'm so, so sorry to hear that. Thank you. So where did you study? Uh, so I went to undergraduate at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Uh, I graduated early, I, I, so I finished my undergraduate education in three years, and then went to law school at Boston University School of Law, uh, which is one Boston of the top University. law schools. Don't say it so fast. I mean, that's an elite school, Boston uh, University. It, I, I was very grateful to uh, have been accepted, and uh, I'm very proud of my legal education. And uh, Boston was such a nice city, but I, I didn't get to enjoy it because I was studying so hard. Uh, for the three years that I was in law school. But uh, I, I graduated uh, with honors from Boston University School of Law and then moved to Miami with my wife. That's beautiful. So why law? You could have been a doctor, an architect, a painter. Why law? So I think law is a career that gives practitioners the tools to reach justice. You don't have to be a judge to administer justice. You can be a lawyer. You can be an advocate as well. And uh, I was very uh, eager to develop those tools. And when lawyers look at themselves before entering law school and after leaving law school, uh, the power of um, 
exploratory, of argument, of critical analysis uh, becomes very sharpened. So that was my primary driver. So do you think that from an early on, you knew that you had very good critical skills, thinking skills, if you will? Yeah, from early on, I always thought I was going to do something in the sciences or mathematics. Really? Um, yes, I was uh, well, writing was- That's right, with the beard and everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I'm still, I, I still, even though I don't practice, I still enjoy mathematics, I enjoy uh, and my, my current hobby is animation. So I, I've animated, personally animated all of our campaign commercials. Um, so I, I still enjoy that kind of stuff. But I think that developing in areas where one perhaps isn't um, naturally strong helps create a balance that uh, gives a, a very good perspective uh, to critical thinking and analysis. Beautiful. Okay, so talk to us about your law career. Take us through your whole history. You graduated Boston University, and then yes. what did you do? So uh, after graduating, uh, we moved to Florida. My wife and I decided that I would submit resumes only to South Florida and Southern California. Uh, Boston is very cold, and we wanted yes. to move somewhere warm and plant roots, and uh, it was the greatest decision that we ever made, uh, Miami quickly became our home. I'm so excited to raise my son here. Um, how, my, son, how old is your son? I know he's very little. Uh, so, so he's uh, uh, a few months away from turning three. Oh, and so he, he's what three going on seven. He has the energy <laughs> of uh, a superhero. <laughs> That is but, uh, he, he's great. He's wonderful. And well, um, I'm sure you're reading a lot to him. I remember when my daughter was that age and my sister Fanny Elias, we would take my kid back then, Barnes and Nobles that had a million stores everywhere, bookstores, and I would read, read, read. And you as a lawyer, I'm sure you're doing the same thing. Yes. So so I've read to him since he was an infant and he, he's already conscious of, he's multilingual. So I speak Japanese in addition to Spanish. And we, we speak all three languages in the, in the household. I'm, I'm the only person in the household who speaks Japanese. And, and he's at the point now where he recognizes the difference of language. So if he learns a new word, he'll ask me, Daddy, en español, or mi You know and, what uh, a blessing that is, Joe? You're preparing him for the world. That is beautiful. So, so you so say excited. you speak Japanese. How did that happen? That's wonderful. <laughs> so when my wife went to graduate school, she said, Joe, you have three years get a hobby. And uh, I decided that um, I, I would learn Japanese. Uh, I, I took it for two semesters in college. We had recently visited Japan for the first time. Uh, I, I didn't realize that that endeavor would turn into uh, a multi-year battle between me and the Japanese language as to who would uh, ultimately prevail. So uh, <laughs> during that time, I also learned how to uh, read and write over 2,000 Chinese characters that were incorporated into the Japanese writing system. Wow. Um, and I, I visited- That's impressive. Uh, I, I, I think anyone can do it with the appropriate techniques. Um, you know, uh, uh, the power of our memory facilities as humans is so strong, we just need guidance. So I studied memory techniques before uh, studying the language, but uh, it was very exciting. It was uh, the most difficult puzzle I've ever done. That's excellent. So you graduated, you moved with your wife. What kind, when did you know that you wanted to go into specific specialties? Because I know that you have a specialty in litigation with business disputes. You do a local, national, and foreign governments as well, banking, right. finance. So talk to us. Sure, sure. So um, I, I, I'm not, I don't have a specialty in the Florida bar sense of the word, but I do have a focus on these areas of law. But I, I kind of allowed the practice to take me where it needed to take me rather than vice versa. So um, in as the market, uh, after the collapse uh, in, in the Great Recession in 2007, there were a lot of banking cases. And I appreciated the ability to um, litigate a, in a lot of different complex areas of law. Um, and as the market continued to evolve, uh, we started getting a lot of bank fraud cases. And the financial fraud cases uh, are fun to me because I love I love getting deep into the numbers. 
and uh, painted that's a picture. That's right. You did say you love math, so that's good. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, and then it just it evolved like that. But that sounds pretty up. intricate, Joe. I mean, banking and the numbers and fraud. I mean, that's um, really interesting. Well, I, I find it interesting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a litigator first, so that's my current caseload. It involves a lot of those cases, but I've litigated business disputes, contract disputes, um, defamation cases. Um, yeah, so what the, about, the range what about checks that, that, you know, I know that a lot of our views can relate because I know I've gotten some checks that people have given me that bounce back, like worthless yeah. and useless checks. Have you had cases like that? I've had a lot of cases like that, yes. So, really? um, you know, one area uh, of fraud that is still prevalent, and a lot of even lawyers fall victim to it, uh, is uh, fraudsters solicit or send a check to a, a lawyer, for example. Uh, they, they might, on an unsolicited, in an unsolicited email, say, I'd like to hire you for a case. Here's a check uh, for your retainer payment. Um, when we close the transaction, I need you to wire, deposit the check, wire 90% of it to the other party to the transaction. The lawyer does it, and then a few days later, uh, the check is not paid because it's fraudulent or forged, and uh, the, the lawyer is out of luck. And not just the lawyer, any victim. So I, I've had, exactly. yeah. So if so you ever get a check, you're right? Not, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> yeah. Just, just if you ever get a check and you're not, you're unaware of the source, then investigate, investigate, investigate. And if you're ever asked to deposit a check and you're unaware of its source, wait a very long time before the, moving the money that the bank provides you for the check. Because if you go to your bank and you deposit a check, in many cases, the money from that check will become available before the check clears. So the fraud is convincing people to send that provisionally credited money to the fraudster before the, the fact that the check is fraudulent is discovered. Very, very interesting. What about, I'm thinking about the viewers, a lot of them are business owners, I'm sure. Uh, what about employment law? Do you deal with that too? So so I've, I've advised on employment law issues occasionally, but it, it's certainly not a bread and butter area of practice. Okay, but you come across that as well. Okay, so let's turn over a little bit onto your community involvement, because I know that you have a lot of community involvement, and I want to compliment you here publicly. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, they get into their job, and they're focused and focused, and they don't have time for anything else. But you seem to find the time to do a lot of community involvement. So I want to publicly commend you for that, Joe. No, thank you. And uh, I, I just... Again, with I'm your doing... no, no More Tears. Uh, well, No More Tears is one organization in which I'm involved. Um, you know, I... I I try to do my small part whenever I can because I firmly believe that uh, small acts add up, uh, and small acts by all of us can can change the world. So, uh, w one organization um, for which I serve on an advisory board is No More Tears, uh, an organization that exists to provide direct assistance to uh, victims of human trafficking and sexual violence. Uh, it's an organization that. Uh, you know, a lot of victims, especially now in times of COVID, are trapped. Their homes can be, become a prison. And No More Tears provides means for even if a victim uh, has no economic power, no place to, to sleep, no, no food to eat other than at the hand of the, the, the perpetrator, No More Tears will provide all of that. So you call, they take you out of the house, give you a place to stay. Um, try to help you with, with, with any legal restraining orders uh, or medical care. And, um, and I, yeah, love this, I love it because, uh, as you know, this is a $150 billion industry. And uh, I'm very, very familiar with that because we have a powerhouse. Uh, when I was working for FNU, I'm furloughed right now. We had a powerhouse that composed of very, very important people like yourself. And what we did was we had all these organizations, including No More Tears, and we would educate the community, mm -hmm. our kids. A big shout out to our superintendent, Alberto Garbajo, and all the educational leaders out there, because mm -hmm. we would bust in about over a thousand mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. And we really, really, really loved it because we knew that we were educating them and we were avoiding those kids to become you know, victims at a later age. So that's, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. So I commend you for helping out. 
for sure. Uh, thank you. And I, I just do my small part. And, um, you know, in addition to No More Tears, I, I've uh, been involved for many years in collecting uh, toys for the children of inmates. Um, you know, regardless of whether parents are paying a debt to society, children are innocent. And um, you know, I, I think that by providing hope and providing happiness at a young age, that can really affect the development of children. I've That's also routinely volunteered for 100 Black Men of South Florida, uh, an, uh, an organization that provides shopping sprees, shopping sprees over the holidays uh, to underserved children. And, oh, I love uh, it! <laughs> if, Rachel, if you want perspective, look into the eyes of a child smiling when that child can spend $100 on anything they want. Um, so it just, it, it helps ground, ground you. That is so, so true. I commend you for that. Let's take a little break. When we come back, I still want to talk about your involvement. I want to give thanks to our advertisers. I'd like to begin with Jose Milton Foundation, Anna Vega Milton. She's amazing. She's a philanthropist known by everybody here in Miami-Dade County. Thank you, Anna, for your research, for thinking so much about education, for healthcare issues. We love you very much. Joe, thank you so much for advertising on the show. You're going to make a great circuit court judge. You certainly have the qualifications. You believe in justice and equality. You have lots of integrity. Of course, we have Nicole Alvarez, who's also an attorney. She concentrates on family law, on immigration, on criminal work. So anybody that needs a lawyer as far as that, you can call Nicole. You're going to be hearing about her soon. We're going to bring her on the show. Survivor's Pathway. And I know that you know Survivor's Pathway, Dr. Francesco Dubelli, uh, Joe. He is the president and CEO for all of our viewers of uh, Survivor's Pathway. He deals with sexual assault issues, human trafficking issues, domestic violence issues, and the list goes on and so forth. Jackson Health Foundation, the fundraising arm of one of the best hospital systems in the nation, Jackson Health System. So a big shout out to Charmaine, to Flavia, to Yolanda, and to, of course, the president and CEO, Carlos Megoya. And, of course, United Home Care. A big shout out to Carlos uh, Martinez, who is the president and CEO. He's taking care of adults in your home. Why? Because home is the best place to be. So big shout out and a big kiss. There you go to all our advertisers. Joe, I know that you also have worked in the Betty, Betty Ferguson Recreational uh, a clinic for, for legal services. Talk to us a little bit about that. So I, the Wilkie Ferguson Junior Bar Association uh, organizes quarterly clinic, legal clinics. Uh, sometimes they're at the Betty Ferguson Recreational Center. And uh, another time it was at the, in Coconut Grove. Another time it was in Brownsville. So, so the volunteering uh, is at the clinic, not at the actual center. At the right. center is just a venue. Uh, and and at those so clinics, the party. Yeah, so many people. So many people, yes, throughout the county. Yeah. And, and my hats off, by the way, to the Wilkie Ferguson Bar Association, and not just the Wilkie Ferguson. Uh, it, it's it's always a joint effort with Caribbean Bar Association and, and other bar associations. They are very, very, very um, committed and loyal to the ideal of serving our community and giving back. So, yes. and what I love what I love about those clinics is that they provide uh, an opportunity when you, maybe you don't have a case that needs to go to court, but you have some legal questions. Uh, and maybe you, your questions can be answered in a few minutes. So so these voluntary bar associations organize lawyers with different backgrounds uh, in different areas of law, uh, criminal lawyers, family law lawyers, business lawyers, I love it. I love and provide an opportunity to answer questions. So I, I always uh, enjoy participating. Uh, because let's face, it, let's face it, us as lay persons, we always have questions for lawyers. Right. <laughs> so right. I wanna thank you for volunteering. Okay, Joe, so let's talk a little bit about you. You decided to run for circuit court judge. Yes. Why? Um, well, multiple reasons. I, I think the primary driver uh, is service. Uh, that's, it's 100% service. And right now, especially in our state court system, our judges have a lot of cases. Uh, in the largest division of our court, the circuit civil division, Every year, there are 30,000 to 40,000 case dispositions. That's, That's a, a lot. lot of cases. And each one of those cases involves real people and real consequences. In the second largest division, our felony criminal division, 
Each year, there are another 14,000 divisions, uh, 14,000 dispositions. Each case involves real people and real, real life consequences. And, you know, I firmly believe that if we, we must insist on choosing judges who have that service mentality, who, who, once you serve from the bench to put in the time and the effort and the sweat to make sure that each one of those tens of thousands of cases doesn't just turn into a number on a file, that, that each case is decided based on its individual facts and individual circumstances. And so um, so many, let, let me part, excuse for a second. So with so many cases, but you're talking about thousands of cases, Joe. Right, tens of thousands. What would you do? What would you do if elected on August 18 as our circuit court judge? What would you do to make sure that you will be prepared, Joe, when you have all these thousands of cases that you will be prepared every morning, afternoon, and evening if it takes that, to make sure that you are prepared, that you will rule accurately, you will rule accurately and fairly? What would you do? And, and the answer is simple, put in the time. This is not a, a nine to five job. Uh, it, it, it's anything so but a nine to five days a week, no, and over 13 hours a day. Uh, well, I, 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 not seven days a week, but if I need to work seven days a week, I will. Uh, okay. the, 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 the accuracy of the decisions comes first. So yeah, if I, if I need to work both days on the weekend because during the week I'm in trial every single day, because of the, the matters before me, then I will. Uh, but more importantly, it's the mentality. It's a, it's a service mentality. So I, I'm an early riser anyway. Um, drives my wife crazy. Uh, she, she, she wakes up relatively early too. But um, I, I, offering hearings, if the litigants want them early in the morning, because I know I, as a practitioner, I'd rather be able to get an issue resolved next week at 7.30 in the morning then wait six weeks so I can sleep in and out. Right. Uh, that's, and, a good and I think, point. that's a good point, Joe, because a lot of people, you know, they have a case, they have to wait so many weeks because the docket is full. So you're willing to sacrifice, you know, your time and read all the cases, be ready. So somebody like me or anybody, all the viewers that are watching can go before you. If elected on August 18 as a circuit court judge from Miami-Dade County, we will feel confident to go before you that you have read all the materials put before you, correct? 100%, 1,000%. That's why I'm doing it. Okay, excellent. Can you explain for the layperson out there, including myself, what's the difference between a Miami-Dade County judge and a mm -hmm. circuit court judge? Sure. So uh, the, the circuit court and the county court are our two levels of trial court in the state of Florida, in our state system. The circuit court is the highest trial court in the state of Florida, and it is also the lowest appellate court in the state of Florida. Interesting. So for, for example, uh, if um, there's a criminal case, I will have jurisdiction over felony cases, cases in which you can spend anywhere from one year in prison to life in prison or lose your life at the hand of the state. A county judge would have jurisdiction over uh, cases where the most you could time you could spend in jail is up to one year or less than one year. In the civil division, uh, if you have a, a monetary dispute that is less than $30,000, the county court has jurisdiction. My jurisdiction will start at $30,000, and the, the sky's the limit. So it can be millions, wow. billions, trillions, whatever. So being uh, a circuit court judge is very responsible position. There's no question about it. You know, it's a very serious office. Uh, we, need, we need very serious people. But the circuit court also, in family law cases, or basically in any case that involves children. So whether it's a case to um, determine parental rights, to take a child out of the home, if it's a juvenile delinquency case, only the circuit court has jurisdiction. Uh, in family law cases, if there's a consensual divorce without children, the county court has jurisdiction, but if it's a contested divorce, the circuit court has jurisdiction. Uh, any probate matters, so if someone in your family dies and that relative's assets need to be administered. The circuit court has jurisdiction. And then finally, the circuit court has appellate jurisdiction over certain decisions of the county court. Wow, so this is very responsible. This is serious stuff. 
Yes. That's why, you know, I wanted to invite you tonight because I want people to get to know you, your personality, what you stand for, so on and so forth. We are now in the midst of COVID-19. Our world uh, also is in turmoil. You know, we need to seek justice for all, equality for all. What would you say are, are some of the most challenging issues right now facing our judges? Sure. So, you know, I, I, it's not just a challenge facing our judges. We're, we're facing a challenge to our justice system, to, to our judiciary as an institution, to our ability as a people to reach speedy justice because juries cannot be impaneled right now. And the right to a jury is a constitutional right in many, in many circumstances uh, for many types of cases. Um, we need to evolve as an institution to, to, so an entire branch of government just doesn't stop serving it, the community. Um, Zoom, you know, it, it, this strategy has been so terrible. COVID is the worst tragedy I can think of. I agree. But if there's a silver lining in a terrible tragedy, it's that this tragedy has forced our court system to embrace the technology of our era. So now we're seeing judges embrace Zoom. Tech savvy judges and not so tech savvy judges, <laughs> they're forced to embrace it. And this is an example of... Well, let's face it, Joe. I mean, my, at least my generation. I can't speak for your generation. Mm -hmm. But my generation, we didn't grow up with computers. We grew right. up with typewriters and the white out there on the, on the computer. I mean, we did not. Right. So it's hard for someone that didn't yeah. grow up with computers. Yeah, it, it's hard, but it's a, it's a good thing that it's, it's being forced. Again, yes. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's a silver lining out of a tragedy. Yeah, now uh, that we have it, we can say, well, how do we do without it? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And and if you've ever had to, to pay for a lawyer, lawyers are very, very expensive. So it, what Zoom does is it brings efficiency to litigation in many aspects, uh, not all cases. But uh, rather than having to pay your lawyer to drive to the courthouse and pay for parking in a very expensive parking lot True. and sit in a courtroom waiting for an hour to argue a five minute hearing, now your lawyer can be doing other things. And when it's time to argue your case, your lawyer can log into Zoom from her or his desk and charge you for that time. Right. Uh, so, it's more so, convenient for the clients. It's a lot more convenient. For the clients, for the lawyers, for the court. For everybody. Um, yes, in, in most types of hearings. You know, we, we, I think that the area where, where we really need to uh, figure out what we're going to do is criminal, in the criminal division. Because uh, you can't, in civil cases, and, and we're, as the institution now is testing, uh, there's a pilot project to administer civil jury trials by Zoom. So the jurors will be watching the case uh, via Zoom. But uh, there are some very serious constitutional questions as to whether that's even a possibility in a criminal case. Right, excellent. So also I wanna to mention to all our viewers that you have received many endorsements. I'd like to mention mm -hmm. some. A lot of the police organizations, congratulations, are endorsing you. you. Uh, now, you know, National uh, Women are endorsing you. I mean, so many people, a uh, pack save with the LGBTQI community are also endorsing you. I mean, how do you feel? I mean, you're receiving all these endorsements of all these great institutions and organizations. Talk to us. Yeah, no, it, it, it's humbling. It, it's very humbling, but you know, I, I, I my, my focus is on serving the community, and I'm, I'm so grateful that you know, our endorsement list is so large, so incredibly large. Uh, and, and it, you know, it, to me, it reaffirms the basic message that although we live in such a diverse county and yes. our individual circumstances are, are singular, uh, there are basic creeds around which we can unite as a people. So. Uh, all, yes, all police organizations that endorse have endorsed me. Firefighters, National Organization for Women. I've also been endorsed by uh, the chair of the Black Affairs Advisory Board. Francesco Duvalli, who you mentioned earlier, he's on our committee. He's the yes. chair of the Hispanic Affairs Advisory Board. The co-chair of the Gay and Lesbian Lawyers Association. Uh, the past president of the Florida Association for Women Lawyers. And the list keeps going on. And, 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 the list, and it's like who's who in Miami-Dade County and beyond. 
you know, I, I'm very grateful and, and humbled. And, and you can see the full list on our website, which is vote-joe.com. Outstanding. And the last question I want to ask you is policy. Mm -hmm. If you should win and select that on August 18 as our circuit court judge, mm -hmm. you have way qualification. I said that before and I'll say it again. Would you like to see any new policies implemented to improve the court system, Joe? I, I would love to see a lot of new policies to improve the court system yeah. implemented. Um, you know, our, our courts are underfunded. And uh, judges and judicial candidates, we are ethically constrained uh, in the subject matters where we can advocate from a policy perspective. But there's no constraint when it comes to advocating for policy to improve the judiciary. And you know, you know, I believe, and I have a fire about this inside of me, that, you know, that the stronger our judiciary is as an institution, right. the stronger we are as a people. Because you know, this great country can survive in so, only in so far as justice is available for everyone, justice is blind, justice is accurate. So um, whether, whether it's advocating for additional funding for the judiciary, uh, advocating for um, basically allotment of law clerks where in the federal system, each judge has, uh, well, er, earlier I talked about the thousands of cases that circuit, state circuit judges have. In our federal system in the Southern District of Florida, uh, the last I checked, the average judge had a caseload of, I think it was around 295 cases. And, and within that caseload, uh, uh, notwithstanding that caseload, the average judge, federal judge has two to three assigned law clerks, very bright recent law grads who are still hungry in the career um, and, and in the field, filtering through information, fact checking, um, doing well, legal research. Of, 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 of law cases and the, and the lawyers are clerks, don't you think we need more? We three I think we have. With three is not enough, right? Well, no, I think that whether two is enough or three is enough, it works in the federal system. Okay. Uh, in, in our state system, there's a, uh, at least in Miami-Dade County, there's a centralized law clerk pool. Uh, now, I can argue both sides of-, of Well, you're a lawyer, of both sides. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I believe that having assigned the law clerks, uh, the law clerks learn how the judge thinks. Uh, the law clerks can learn to anticipate the questions that the judge is going to have. So, so I think that from a, an information filtering perspective, from an accuracy perspective, that would be my preference. But you know, what, I, I, I will never claim to be the guy who's going to show up in the robes and change the world. But, right. but I will definitely be the guy who's always loud. I will definitely be the guy who, who's always focused and asking questions about how we can improve. And you will be accessible, which is outstanding. Yes, accessible. Well, Joe, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for sharing your story, your platform, what you stand for. Congratulations again that you're running as a candidate for Miami-Dade County Circuit Court Judge Group 55. See, I memorized that, Group 55. Yes, yes. Is there a last minute message, Joe, that you would like to leave all our viewers tonight with? Uh, first, thank you for taking the time to listen to this interview. I'm so grateful and humbled. And uh, you know, I, I, family is something that's very important to me. And as I mentioned earlier, my wife, Fernanda, and I, a few years ago, welcomed into this world our first child. The unity that Fernanda and I feel with Graham inspires me. Because as a family, united, we can overcome any obstacle. But right now, the unity strengthens not just families, but communities. And right now, it is very easy to feel that we, as a people, are hopelessly divided. I'm running for judge because through that office, I can help unite us. Because whether you're old, young, black, white, Haitian, Cuban, Latin, gay, straight, disabled, not disabled, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or a non-believer, we can all unite behind the basic creed that a judiciary that is attentive, impartial, and intellectually honest benefits all of us as one family. So I humbly ask for your vote on August 18th. You can start voting by mail at the end of this week. Again, my name is Joe Perkins. My punch number is 
And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Rachel, for uh, the kind invitation for your program. Thank you, Joe. It's been a great interview. God bless you. We wish you the best of luck in your endeavors. And um, we'll see you uh, in court. <laughs> And to all our viewers tonight, thank you so much for joining On Point with Rachel Turgerman. Please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, On Point with Rachel Turgerman. I'm so elated that you had an opportunity to get to know Joe Perkins and definitely see that he's qualified to be our next circuit court judge. God bless you. Please be safe. Abide by the CDC guidelines. You know, wear your mask, wash your hands, watch that social distancing. Someday, you know, we're going to go back to the old normalcy. I know that now we're going to have a new normalcy, but someday if you do your part, my friends, and I do my part and we all do our part, someday we'll have the old normalcy back. God bless you. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye for now. No, you're good.